for our Q&A on growing, growing your own native plants. Um, my name is Ellie Blaine and I work on soil health outreach with the Marion County SWCD. Um, we really wish we could all be in a room together, see your faces and have more of an engaging dialogue, but we certainly thank you for joining us virtually today. Um, and I'll just go over a few housekeeping things and then we'll turn it over to Kevin for our presentation. So we'll start with about a 20 minute presentation by Kevin Tunzevic um, to introduce some of the keys of starting your own native wildflowers and grasses. Um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for the remaining time until one. So hopefully that gives us a nice long time to get some of those questions rolling and, and answer, um, answer what's happening, answer what your questions are. Let's see, we have somebody here that can't hear. Can, can everybody hear me, I hope? Everybody else? All right, thank you. So Kevin Tunzevic is the senior ecologist with Ecologic LLC, and he has provided technical advice for numerous large scale native restoration projects throughout Indiana. Um, he developed the product line and managed sales and production of about 200 species of native wildflowers, grasses, and sedges for 22 years at Spence Nursery, which is a wholesale native plant nursery here in Muncie, Indiana. Um, and correct me, Kevin, if I'm wrong on any of that. So for the Q&A portion, please just type your questions into the chat window. Um, we initially really wanted people to ask questions verbally, but since we had um, a great response and about 400 people registered for this, we wanna keep the, the questions in the chat only. Um, you can post your questions at any point and then I'll moderate them with Kevin after he finishes with his slides. We'll also record all the questions during this session. Um, and if we can't get to them all, we'll try to follow up with you individually afterwards to, to make sure you get your question answered and are ready for spring growing. We'll be recording the session and then Kevin has generously said that we can provide the slides to everybody after the, the session. Lastly, the funding support for these workshops is provided in part by the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, the National Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, as well as Clean Water Indiana, and the USDA NRCS is an equal opportunity provider, employer, and lender. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin Tunzevic. Thanks, Elena. Um, I'll go ahead and get started here. And uh, so, um, we're going to begin the presentation talking about uh, acquisition of the seeds, so seed sources and origins. And um, of course, uh, when obtaining native seeds, the, the most important thing is uh, to remember that a lot of native plants have a very broad range that can be ranged from, say, little blue stems native to 46 of the 48 uh, contiguous states. So obviously, little blue stem from Texas isn't the same as little blue stem from Maine. So you want to have a seed origin that's somewhat local, so it's adapted to your growing season length, your soils and geology, and uh, and your your climate in general. Now, um, so generally, as I noted, seed origins that are geographically close to your site are better, and um, if you have the ability to collect seed from the locally native population, that's even even that is the best. Um, scenario, but make sure you have permission to collect from private property and keep in mind that commercial collecting isn't allowed on public lands or DNR lands or preserves. And uh, it's best to make sure that you, if you're purchasing seed, you want to have the seed um, in your hands by late fall to make sure you can uh, go through all the processes that uh, treat the seed and uh, enable it to, to break its dormancy. So as I mentioned, local origin uh, or local genotype seed will produce the best plants adapted to your local condition. And for these, uh, and especially, um, I'll note the phenology. Um, when I started at a native plant nursery, the first year we had a project that spring that we didn't have time to grow some plants for. Uh, we ordered some swamp milkweed from a, a, a native plant nursery in Minnesota. 
and we had some left over and we found that the ones from Minnesota went dormant three weeks earlier than our native uh, swamp milkweeds. And that has some real consequences for uh, phenology of, uh, of creatures that depend on those um, plants such as monarchs, which uh, typically use swamp milkweed very heavily in the later part portion of the season because the uh, more abundant common milkweed tends not to produce as much new foliage later in the season. So that's an important thing to remember um, when, when, when uh, choosing the uh, source of your seeds to have from an area that has a similar length growing season. So it's better to get your seeds from a place east or west of you than north or south of you because east or west of you will have less of a difference in growing season length. Um, and of course, um, be adapted to your, to your soil moisture and hydrology. There's some evidence that little blue stem that's uh, from Indiana it grows better in moister or wetter soils than little blue stem from, from more Western origins where the climate is drier, for example. Now, nearly all um, native plants have some kind of dormancy mechanisms that may be broken by environmental conditions before the seed will germinate. And this prevents the seed from falling on the ground in the late summer or fall and germinating immediately when it wouldn't have time to establish before the winter. So the most common mechanism is an extended period of cold weather that these uh, seeds have to go through before they will, before that they will be able to germinate. And uh, freezing is generally not necessary. So don't think you need to put your, your seeds in the freezer, but an extended period of 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal. So the refrigeration works really well. Um, most forbs also require a period of moist stratification, which I'll explain in more detail shortly, ranging from 30 to 90 days. And there are some seeds that also require other treatments such as scarification of the seed coat or even a, a very few Indiana seeds require this, but some re more out west where uh, fires are more frequent um, require a heat treatment that imitates the effects of fire. So all seeds should be stored in refrigeration throughout the winter to maintain their viability and help break dormancy. Uh, legumes tend to be the ones that require scarification of the seed coat. Um, and that most legume seeds, if you're familiar with them, are very hard and fairly large. And uh, that scarification can normally uh, be accomplished by rubbing the seeds between some medium grade sandpaper just to, to nick the seed coat up a little bit. Um, moist stratification that I've mentioned on the last slide that involves mixing the seeds with a moist sterile medium, such as uh, the seed germination mix you'll be using or, or sterile sand or something to that effect. Um, mixing the seed with that moist medium and then placing the container back in refrigeration for the specified period. And that's that uh, really um, that combination of cold and moisture is what breaks the dormancy of most, um, most forbs, a lot of sedges, a few grasses uh, require that as well. And make sure the medium is moist, but not completely saturated because you don't want to, to uh, limit the uh, availability of uh, gases, oxygen, and so forth. There are a few native species, especially um, spring wildflowers that have what's known as recalcitrant seeds. And these are seeds that cannot dry out. They lose viability, if they, so they can't be stored dry. And these, these have to be stored in a moist medium immediately upon collection. And a lot of the spring wildflowers, such as trillium, salandine poppy, um, Dutchman's breeches, bloodroot, these are ant dispersed seeds. Um, and they, they require this, this immediate uh, stratification. And typically, what uh, on this type of seed, you'll 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 uh, put it into moist stratification and leave it at room temperature over the summer, and then refrigerate it in the fall. So it goes through a warm, moist, followed by a cold, moist stratification for germination the following spring. And I can't emphasize uh, uh, enough about the really good information in the Prairie Moon Nursery um, Cultural Guide in their catalog, which is downloadable from their website. 
that is a really good summary of, of seed treatment information. So, um, what, so you've got your seeds uh, treated with the appropriate amount of appropriate length of stratification. So when you go to germinate them, make sure you always utilize a sterile germination mix to minimize the possibility of fungal pathogens. And generally, the smaller the seed, the shallower it should be sown. And you probably remember the old, the old uh, guideline of uh, three times the diameter of the seed is the maximum you'd want to cover it. However, in, when it comes to a lot of these native forbs, especially wetland species that are very small seeded in sedges, they actually require light to germinate and must be sown on the surface. And uh, many spring blooming plants, um, for example, the spring wildflowers that I just mentioned, will only germinate in cool soil. So, so if you're germinating them in a greenhouse, um, it's best not to heat the greenhouse very much at night. So you want it to drop down to like 40 degrees in the greenhouse at night and then let the sun heat it up during the day. Um, the surf soil surface should remain moist through, through, throughout the germination period, especially for those that are sown on the surface. You, you need to keep that surface moist throughout the germination period. And you can germinate them in cell trays as shown here or just in a shallow open seedling flat. And uh, either one works really well um, for the uh, for the really, really small seeds, um, sometimes the shallow germination flats that are just open without cells um, maybe work a little better than trying to stick seeds in each individual cell. You can just kind of sprinkle the whole seed uh, moist stratification medium over the open flat. And um, always, uh, again, make sure that you, you keep these uh, consistently moist during the germination period. And then, works ideally if you have a, some sort of mist system or, or can make sure they get watered at least once a day on sunny days. So once your, your seedlings have germinated, you need to grow them onto a transplantable size. And there are a few species, say, um, for example, sylphiums that are related to sunflowers that have very large seeds that you can in, in the container that you may be growing them into because, uh, because they quickly develop a, a big taproot. But most seeds or most species should be started in seedling flats. And then once germination is complete, um, you can hasten the development of the seedlings using a dilute uh, water soluble fertilizer to uh, help them develop to a transplantable size. And you'll want the seedlings to have at least two true leaves. So two leaves beyond the initial cotyledon leaves or before uh, transplanting them into a saleable pot. And keep the seedlings moist following transplanting to hasten establishment. And you can either use a time release fertilizer in the potting mix or fertilize weekly with a water soluble fertilizer to get your uh, plants up to a saleable size once they've been transplanted. So here's uh, some, some uh, examples of some finished pots, uh, depending on what your goals are. Um, you can see on the uh, on your left is a, uh, some dense blazing star in a two inch pot, which is uh, what a lot of wholesale growers use. And then there's a more, a little larger, looks like about a three inch pot with uh, some Heliopsis in it there, uh, which is a, a nice saleable size for a farmer's market or, or other uh, retail outlet. And plants may be successfully installed in the field from either size. Um, so so uh, most commercial installations use those two inch plugs um, you, you can see being installed on the left. But um, whereas a lot of uh, more retail or homeowner uh, landscaping jobs, will, you want to use a little larger plant like these one gallon plants you see on the right. So I'm gonna just quickly review some, uh, some possible species uh, that, that are generally popular and relatively well known, um, including some graminoids, uh, some grasses, and then some uh, different forbs of different families. So little blue stem that I mentioned earlier, this is a native warm season prairie grass. 
So this is not going to germinate until you have consistently warm soil temperatures near 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's attractive warm season grass that has really nice reddish brown fall color that lingers through the winter. And unlike some of the taller grasses like big blue stem, this one stands well throughout the winter and through all sorts of weather and only grows about two, usually about three feet in height. Prairie drop seed is one of the, our most attractive native grasses. It's native to prairies. It's a little slow to develop. It takes about three years to get a, a clump as large as the one you see in the photo, but it has really fine texture, excellent fall color. And unlike the little blue stem you saw, even though this blooms in the late summer like a, like a warm season grass, it all actually germinate in much cooler soil. So this one will germinate earlier in the spring in a, in a cooler soil situation. And uh, the inflorescence of this one is rare for a grass is actually fragrant and uh, smells like uh, it's been likened to cilantro or buttered popcorn. And some people like the smell and others complain about it. So keep that in mind. Uh, a woodland grass, it's a really a nice species for ground covers. Of course, a lot of the uh, traditional ground covers that have been used by the nursery industry are invasive plants like Vinca minor and Euonymus fortunii and English ivy. So this is a good substitute, a good native substitute for those invasive species. So beet grass is a, is a great one. It has a Shiny leaves are, are up to two feet long, but they arch over, and so the plant generally isn't that tall. And the inflorescence also arches over under the weight of these very heavy grains. And then it has a golden fall color that fades to tan, but this is, a, again, a woodland grass that does really well in shade and, and works really well as a shady ground cover. Moving on to some of the wildflowers, um, butterfly weed is a popular one that um, does really well in, in dry soils and poor, poor nutrient poor soils. So it's going to need good drainage to, to thrive in the landscape. It's pretty easy to grow in a greenhouse. It germinates one of the, those forbs that will actually germinate without moist stratification just after cold storage. And it'll often flower the first year if started early. It develops a very thick taproot. So once you plant it in Make sure you're planting it in its permanent location in the ground because it's difficult to move once, once it's established. But, uh, and of course, this is a species of, uh, of milkweed. So it's a larval food plant for uh, monarch butterflies. And this is one of the earlier blooming milkweeds. So it provides nectar a lot in, that, in the season in June when there aren't quite as many flowers blooming in open areas as there are later in the summer. Swamp milkweed is a really great plant for uh, monarchs. Uh, it does well in moist to wet soil and does not do well in sharply drained or very dry soils. It germinates readily follow, following moist stratification. Very important larval food source for monarch butterflies, especially for those larger generations that are later in the season in August. And it uh, grows about three to four feet in height. The, the flowers have a very, uh, very nice fragrance in the afternoons when the pollinators are active. And um, really a great plant um, for a variety of pollinators and of course, again, the larval food plant for monarchs. Moving on to some of the cone flowers, uh, Echinacea purpurea needs a little introduction. It's really easy to grow. Um, generally, I moist stratify it. You'll get some, some germination without moist stratification, but it germinates more uniformly with it. And there's a lot of, uh, there's some cultivars that are actually seed cultivars too, where you can get seeds for the, uh, for some different uh, color variations of it. But, um, but in general, for maximum value for wildlife, you're going to want to stick to wild genotypes. Here's a really easy one to grow, the early sunflower um, following moist stratification. It germinates in cool soil and uh, has a long blooming season from late June through September. Can self-sow a lot in the garden, so it's best in sort of informal situations. Grows about four feet tall, but uh, one, of the, one of the best for providing a long season of summer color. 
and a long, long season of value for pollinators. There's a variety of uh, other cone flowers and black eyed Susans. So in the foreground of this picture, you can see the yellow cone flower, Retibita pinata, one of our easiest prairie plants to, to grow. And uh, to the uh, right of that, that's not quite open, you can see a Rudbeckia, that's Rudbeckia subtomentosa. And that's another great plant of similar height, but it blooms a little later. So the Retibita peaks in July through early August, the Rudbeckia subtomentosa peaks later in through August and in, into the middle of September. So they both uh, provide rather similar function in the in the wildflower meadow, and they're both fairly tall plants um, that are best in, in little more informal situations with other tall plants. But uh, birds like the seeds of, of all these cone flowers, and they're they're really really great uh, plants for pollinators and great for uh, residential wildflower meadows. Moving on to later in the season, some of the asters are really good plants. They're really attractive. Um, smooth aster, um, Symphiotrichum levi, is a really attractive um, lavender or medium blue to lavender flowered aster. Great for butterflies and bees, about three feet in height and relatively easy to grow and does great in, uh, in well-drained soil in sun or partial shade. And then New England aster is the well-known purple aster with the bright yellow centers. And this is a very important plant for migrating monarch butterflies. It blooms for a long period during the, during the uh, monarch migration in September into early October and um, it's a very important nectar source. Um, sometimes I, I re remember back in the 80s when monarchs were more abundant, um, you would see oftentimes dozens of monarchs clustered on big clumps of New England aster during the migration in September. It's easily grown. It is a rather tall, lanky plant, so it's best to, to plant it with some other robust perennials like the, the cone flowers in the previous slides. And, um, but and it's one that um, if you do want to keep it a little shorter around uh, Memorial Day or early June, you can cut it back to about halfway and it will regrow but bloom at a, at a lesser height. Moving on to some of the lagoons, um, wild senna is uh, one of our showiest um, native lagoons. It's a very robust plant, it grows about up to five feet in height very showy cluster of yellow flowers, followed by uh, long black seed pods. But this plant is probably the best plant for a lot of our native bees, particularly bumblebees use this plant extremely heavily. At, uh, when I worked at the seed nursery, we would have rows of this for seed production. And as you approach the rows when they're in flower, there is an audible buzz because there is there were literally thousands of bumblebees on these seed production rows um, pollinating them. And a great a garden perennial is uh, the blue false indigo, Baptisia australis, really attractive blue flowers in late May, early June. And it's, uh, there's several other false indigos, the cream false indigo and the white false indigo, but they're slower to develop and a little more Picky. This one's a lot easier to grow and a lot, a lot bloom, develops faster and often blooms in the third, usually in the third year, whereas some of the, sometimes the white and cream false indigo take three to five years to actually flower. All of the false indigos develop a long taproot, so you'll want to plant them in their final location because they're not easy to transplant once they're well, well established. And finally, moving to some mints, um, the bergamot the, uh, uh, is a very popular one, uh, genus Monarda, often called bee balm, attracts a wide variety of pollinators. Um, again, it's best in a naturalized situation with other tall plants and very easy to germinate and grow, has fragrant foliage and attracts a really wide variety of bees, butterflies and other pollinators. And then finally, the mountain mint, um, Pignanthemum virginianum. This is a non-aggressive mint that's only about 18 inches tall. It will slowly spread by rhizomes, but not as fast as most members of the family. 
and um, very attractive white flowers in midsummer that attract just a myriad of pollinators from bees to beetles and wasps. And the flowers are always just alive with a, a real variety of pollinators. So that is my uh, presentation. So we are ready to um, go ahead and uh, take some questions, I think. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I'm just working on getting those questions collected. Uh, just one second and we'll start out. So some of this you already covered, but we um, had quite a few questions come in ahead of time regarding collecting um, seeds from the field especially grass seeds, milkweed seeds, um, and then how to store and prep those collected seeds. I apologize if you already covered some of this um, earlier, but if you could just review a little bit of that, that would be great. Okay, so, so um, a lot of uh, native seeds out in the wild, um, you need to collect them just before what we call they shatter, which means the seed head breaks apart. So you need to get out there um, and uh, collect before before the seeds natural mechanisms for dispersal happen. Now with grasses, uh, the seeds often hang together, but then the, the uh, inflorescence will start to dry, break apart once the seeds are dry. But for other species, you'll want to harvest them when they're not completely dry. For example, um, say um, seeds such as silphiums that are uh, the prairie docks and compass plants and rosin weeds, cup plant, you'll want to harvest those when the seeds are plump but uh, not completely dry because what happens if you leave them out, out to completely dry, the goldfinches will come cut a neat little slit in the seed and pull the uh, kernel out. So. Um, so that, that's an important thing to remember. And any seed, obviously, that you collect when it's not completely dry, you need to uh, physically allow it to dry in, a, in an airy, um, well-ventilated area. Uh, so it, otherwise, um, it will likely uh, tend to, to mold in the refrigerator, unless it's one of those recalcitrant seeds that I mentioned earlier that can't dry out, in which case you'll want to mix it with a moist medium, moist sterile medium to store it. Um, but in general, um, you need to make, a lot of times the uh, seeds are fully formed well before the seed heads completely dry. So, so in many cases you can collect it in, in uh, and, and the way to do that is usually if it's a large enough seed, like, like a coneflower or something, you can usually um, uh, cut one of the seeds open and see that the kernel is, is full, firm, and, and generally, generally pale colored when they're mature, um, white or grayish. Um, if they're greenish, they're probably not mature. So um, that, that's one of the things to remember that if you if you wait too late, um, you may lose the all your seeds to uh, goldfinches or other uh, seed predators. Awesome. Um, and then kind of quick, uh, quickly or related, could you go through the process of moist stratification? I know you talked about the importance of that, but from after you've, let's say, either collected your seed or ordered your seed and you have it um, and it's ready for propagation, can you talk about the stratification process? So um, once your seeds are, are are dry, um, you need to look up in a chart like the one I recommended in the cultural guide of the Prairie Moon Catalog on how long um, that particular species needs moist stratification. Because if it only needs 30 days, it's better just to do it for 30 days rather than 90 days and risk the seed introducing rot or something to the seeds. So once you've found how long it needs stratified for, um, when, when you're 30 days away from when you want to sow it, you want to moist stratify it if it said 30 days. And you'll take the seed, 
and mix it with about three or four parts moist sterile media. So you can get your, your seed germination mix and moisten it. Don't make it just saturated goopy wet, but just moisten it. So if it feels super moist and you can just barely squeeze maybe just a drop or two of water out of it, if you squeeze it real hard, that's probably about the appropriate amount of moisture to have in the in the mix. And so mix the seed with three or four parts that moist medium, put it in a uh, bag or, or a container, Ziploc bags work really well, and then um, go ahead and um, uh, stick it back in the refrigerator at about 35 to 40 degrees for the moist stratification period. All right, I appreciate everybody's questions. I'm sorry it's taken me a little bit of time just to sort through them and try to do related questions. Um, a lot of people ask about starting plants in an unheated space, either in an unheated greenhouse or outside in a cold frame or just directly outside um, over the winter. And whether that's possible, what the, what the temperature ranges can be um, and what's best in that sense. Yeah, that, that, that can work very well. You're obviously going to be start, starting things a little later than if you had a heated space available. But um, if you're starting in an unheated greenhouse or cold frame, you'll probably want to start about oh, about the first of April or so because you, you want to be past really hard freezes. Um, so you want to be past like temperatures that are 25 degrees or colder. And um, then you'll want to uh, and make sure that uh, whatever setup you have has ventilation so it doesn't heat up to 150 degrees in the afternoon because <laughs> uh, you, you can you definitely can make it too hot for these plants to germinate properly. So make sure your cold frame you can prop it open during the afternoon or you have ventilation system or so, something to keep it because you really don't want it a much warmer than 80 degrees um, in the uh, during the germination period in the afternoons. Now dropping pretty cold at night usually is not a problem as long as it's not substantially sub freezing. So you don't you don't want to, obviously your seedling flats to freeze solid, although I've had that happen and had the seedlings survive surprisingly. But um, uh, that, um, but yeah, drop, dropping it to 35 or 40 degrees at night is generally no problem for, for a lot of these seeds. Warm season plants, you'll want to wait later, like um, warm season grasses, like little blue stem and Indian grass and, and things like switchgrass, you'll want to wait later in the season to sow those in an unheated space, probably till the first of May or so. But yeah, that, that can work just fine. And if you're sowing directly in the ground, there's a couple strategies you can take. Um, if it's something that needs a long uh, period of moist stratification, you want to go ahead and sow that in uh, November or December and let it naturally moist stratify in the soil over the over the winter. Um, if it's something that requires a short period of moist stratification, you might um, sow it in late February. Or and uh, I've had good good luck at my house doing that, just uh, spreading the seed. Uh, late February and starts to germinate sometime in April. But um, yeah, definitely heated greenhouses are, are not necessary. However, if you're trying to produce plants to be saleable in the spring, it would be fairly difficult to get them uh, to size in the absence of a heated greenhouse. Understood. Um, a lot of people ask about sowing directly into milk jugs, um, that a lot of people are doing that either um, just directly outside, potentially in a, in a greenhouse or cold frame. Um, one person asks about doing it in January and February and if there are any seeds that would not work for this. Um. The type of container isn't all that important as long as it has drain holes and, and uh, dr the, the medium is uh, drains freely. Um, but uh, so yeah, I don't I don't think that's going to be a, a big issue. Um, if you are sowing in containers outside, it's best to keep them on the north side of the building during the winter. So they go through 
So they tend to stay frozen more rather than going through so many freeze and thaw cycles, which can, uh, which can tend to heave the soil a lot. So just, just put them in the shade on the north side of a building over the winter. And then um, when it gets warm, you can move them to a sunnier location. Got it. And we have quite a few questions about the best uh, propagation medium, starting from the, you know, starting out uh, with the, the best for the, the raw seed and then also for potting up. Um, and related to that, I guess I would also ask, like, how do you sterilize your medium or what is considered a sterilized seed medium? Um, and is purchase potting soil okay to start seeds? So what you want to do is purchase a seed starting uh, medium, which is which are generally available at big box stores or or supply stores. Um, a seed starting medium should be sterile to begin with, um, and uh, uh, those can also be ordered from any just about any nursery supply catalog is going to have a seed starting medium. And uh, those are generally going to be a fairly fine textured medium and a, a lot finer than your final potting medium typically will be. Um, so you're so because you'll want something that's fine textured, especially for the smaller seeds to, to germinate through. And so it's generally pretty finely ground up organic material. Um, and uh, sometimes, I guess on the potting mix, um, that does not need to be sterile. And in fact, it, a biologically active potting mix is better than one that's not um, as far as having organisms, bacteria and so forth that are decomposing the, because most all your potting mixes are going to be a soilless or uh, mix made out of uh, organic components. And typically I recommend mixes that are uh, composed to have a base of like composted pine bark or composted rice hulls. Um, some are using coconut fiber now. These are all byproducts of other industries that are relatively environmentally benign. I would recommend against using potting mixes that contain peat and sphagnum because of their environmental effects. Uh, people don't realize the, the, the vital importance of, of Heat as far as storing carbon, uh, a good chunk of our soil carbon, like a third of the soil carbon in the world is stored in peat, which only covers 3% of the land surface. So 30% of, of the soil carbon is more than all the carbon stored in all the world's forests. So you can see that um, the vital importance uh, that the peat is to regulating the climate and once you mine that peat, it starts decomposing and releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it not only destroys a wetland that tends to harbor rare plants, such as orchids and other uh, bog inhabiting plants, but it also, um, it also exacerbates climate change. So try to, try to use um, soil mixes composed of, uh, like I said, those byproducts of other industries like composted pine bark, composted rice hulls, or, or a coconut fiber. Thank you. Um, just quickly on that, do you have any thoughts on inoculating plug media with native harvested or bought um, arbuscular mycorrhizae? Um, that certainly can be beneficial, and um, there are commercially available strains of the, the and what you want is the VAM and endomycorrhizal, um, so it, it's, it actually grows in within the roots, It's because there's endomycorrhizal and there's ectomycorrhizal, and ectomycorrhizal tends to be used by woody plants like oaks, but these herbaceous species, you'll need the, the, the Vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal is what VAM stands for. So, so that's the product you, you, you'll want, an endomycorrhizal product. And yes, it's, and typically what you, you'll introduce that during the, uh, in your potting mix when, when they're transplanted from the seedling flat to the uh, final um, container. 
Just had another question come in. Can you also, would you also recommend adding vermicompost to the potting mix? I'm not super familiar with that product, so I can't, uh, is that just worm compost? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. worm compost. yeah, yeah, worm compost uh, would certainly be fine to, to utilize. I wouldn't have any problem with that. It's uh, definitely got some good nutrient properties. Okay. Just one second. Um, we have a, a, a few questions that aren't wildflower related, but more trees and shrubs. If you could, I know it's not exactly uh, your specialty, but if you could touch on um, propag propagation for shrubs and trees more generally, and also cuttings versus starting from seed. Okay, yeah, I don't have as much experience on that, but um, obviously a lot of the woody plants have larger seeds, so you may even be dealing with something as large as an acorn. So things like that, you'll be direct sowing into a container rather than a seedling flat. And for example, a spice bush has a relatively large seed. And anything with a fleshy covering, like a berry or a fruit, um, you'll need to remove that fleshy covering. So on a spice bush, there's a fleshy, waxy berry over covering a large seed. You want to remove that. And then a lot of these woody seeds are recalcitrant, which are the ones that can't dry out too much. For example, if you dry out a white acorn too much, it won't germinate. So, so that's why um, a lot of, uh, especially the white oak group, tends to, to send out a root or germinate in the fall. So a lot of these woody plants, you should direct sow in their final contain in their uh, container in the fall and uh, overwinter them in the container. And, um, but I don't have, I have very limited experience um, growing from cuttings. So, so that's not something we did very much because in the native plant industry, we were trying to produce a genetically diverse product that has a lot of, uh, so it's better to do a seed propagated product and is, uh, you can end up with all clones doing it from cuttings. Okay. Um, related to starting legume natives, na legume related, leg legume, sorry, natives that are in the, that are legumes, um, do you add any inoculant? Yes, um, and the inoculant is, is uh, specific to that genus. So you'll need to, for example, order inoculant for, for uh, the genus Senna or the inoculant for the genus Baptisia. And you can get those from uh, Prairie Moon Nursery. Excellent. And that takes us into sources. A lot of people, if you're not collecting your own seed, a lot of people are asking, what are the best recommended sources? Um, a lot of people mention Prairie Moon. They're located in Minnesota. How do you tell where the seed is coming from um, and how do you choose what to use? So a lot of those uh, nurseries, even though their Prairie Moon may be located in Minnesota, it's actually a co-op of growers from all over the Midwest. So they can share the origin of, of a specific seed lot with you. So for example, Prairie Moon has a lot of growers that are growing stuff from Illinois, which is a really good seed source for, for this area. So, so um, don't hesitate to ask specific genotype information from your seed supplier. And if you're, if you're buying more um, significant um, quantities of seed in the order of ounces or, or hundreds of dollars worth of seed, the wholesale nurseries in Indiana are, are uh, good source because they all have some local genotypes as well. And what are some of those best sources or Indiana sources? So Indiana sources and keep in mind these all have minimum orders but um, so Spence Restoration Nursery where I used to work, um, uh, Heartland Restoration Nursery um, up in the Fort Wayne area and Cardinal Nursery up in uh, the Walkerton, Indiana. Those are the ones that I'm aware of that have local genotype uh, seed sources. 
And besides prairie moon, are there other seed sources you look for? Yeah, yeah. So Prairie Nursery in Westfield, Wisconsin also has uh, seeds. Um, I've ordered uh, and you can get like packets of seed from Missouri, a wildflower nursery in Missouri, I found to be a, a nice source for, for homeowners and for small quantities of seed if you just need an ounce or two. And um, so there's, there, there's a wide variety of seed nurseries in, in the Midwest and there's, there's others in in uh, Wisconsin that are kind of, uh, well, you can get into naming too many and <laughs> confuse people, but uh, but uh, I, yeah, I'd say the Prairie Nursery, Prairie Moon Nursery, and Missouri Wildflower Nursery would be three three of the best sources for, for the small quantities if you just need an ounce or two. Excellent. This goes back a little bit, but what if any native plants could survive a frost or freeze that might occur after a typical average last frost date, for example, mid-April to early May? So I have not had much problem with uh, having, like I mentioned in the presentation, I've had seedling, I've had the heat go out in a greenhouse and all the seedling flats freeze solid and the darn seedlings all survived after I just ran some water on them. So um, I don't see frost as a big issue for native seedlings. Um, I, I germinated uh, several things at my house last year. And of course, we had that hard freeze in early May and uh, didn't do a thing to any of them. Um, most of these seedlings are adapted to the irregularities of Midwestern weather and very few of them are that susceptible. And the ones that are that susceptible tend to be those ones that will only germinate in really warm soil temperatures, like warm season grasses might get damaged by a late freeze. But in nature, they don't germinate till mid to late May anyway, when they're put in the ground. So, so that's really not a big concern in most cases. Um, late frosts are, are shrugged off by most, most native species. Just one second. Um, how can you prevent rotting from seeds? Like how wet can seeds stay without rotting? Um, I know it's probably species dependent. We also have some questions on, let's see, persimmon seeds, if they need to stay wet. I'll try to look for other related questions. Okay. Um, generally the uh, rot is, uh, a function of the uh, of a lot of uh, a lot of times it's a fungal pathogen. So if you keep the seed relatively sterile, they can tolerate quite a bit of wetness. So we moist stratified them, and they often had the medium a lot moister than what I recommended in my presentation. And we generally had very few rot problems. Um, you're most likely to have rot problems on the larger seeds that have more endosperm in them. So so those are the ones to watch and. Legumes should definitely be moist stratified for a shorter period. They're relatively prone to rotting. But um, in general, as long as you're moist stratifying in a sterile medium, there were, I haven't found rot to be a, a really big problem with the seeds. Okay, good. All right, we have a lot of questions. So just trying to cover the ones that are most related to starting. What is the best way to germinate false indigo? So uh, the baptisias, um, those are a legume. So, so you're, you're gonna wanna, um, scarify them with sandpaper, and then a short period of moist stratification, maybe 10 or 15 days. And then because they develop a taproot almost immediately, 
that it's better to actually sow them directly into a small pot rather than a seedling flat because you'll get a long horizontal taproot in a seedling flat that's then difficult to transplant. So it's better to direct sow those into like a three or four inch deep pot. Um, it, uh, and then that way that taproot can go directly down. We had another question about um, germinating seeds with a thick seed coat and specifically cocoons. I'm not familiar with that. And then is there a good source for a hairy sanctuary cocoon? Yeah, cocoons are, are, I honestly don't have good experience with trying to germinate cocoons. So I'm probably not the uh, <laughs> best person to ask on that one. I didn't try very much in the few times I tried, I had little to no success on cocoons. So um, I would consult the, the Prairie Moon Nursery Catalog and, and wish you luck on, on cocoons, unfortunately. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned persimmons, and that's another one I don't have any, any experience with, but you would definitely obviously remove the fleshy fruit and probably sow the seeds immediately in a moist medium and let them overwinter in that moist soil. I would guess that's what most is most successful for most things with fleshy fruits. Yeah, and I think I was wrong. It's actually pawpaw that they were oh, asking. Oh, pawpaw. Yeah, it's the same process I would recommend. But, but again, I'm, I never grew woody plants in my uh, experience, so so I may not be the best. There's lots of information online about things like that. So I would consult with that, but that's that would be my default mechanism to any fleshy fruit is to remove the fleshy and direct sow the seeds directly into the soil and overwinter them in the in a soil, in the pot in a soil. Okay. And yeah, with persimmon, I guess it was that it had passed through the, the, the seeds that they had passed through the digestive tract of an animal. And is that sufficiently preparing them to plant by natural, natural scarification? Yeah. I would imagine that would be, uh, that's the way nature works. So I would imagine that would be sufficient if you have, uh, if you're able to uh, <laughs> go about it that way. Yep. We have quite a few questions about black walnut trees um, that we know they're difficult in vegetable production. How do, you know, do native plants tolerate them? Are there any native plants that, that do not tolerate having been mulched or, or being next to black walnuts? Um, so most of our native woodland plants are tolerant of being around black walnuts, um, including most of our spring wildflowers and most of our woodland grasses. The uh, the beak grass that I highlighted earlier grows really prolifically under walnut trees. So generally woodland understory plants, as a general rule, most of them tolerate being under black walnuts. I have a lot of black walnuts in my property and I don't really see any difference in the diversity underneath them. And in fact, sometimes the growth is more lush underneath them because they leaf out later. So the, the spring plants get more sun um, than under, say, sugar maples that leaf out earlier and cast a denser shade. So generally, if you're trying to grow native Indiana woodland plants under a black walnut tree, you'll probably be successful. That's good. I think that'll be good for a lot of people to know. Um, this goes into more just management of natives once they're actually planted. Um, people are asking if you know, a lot of them grow so tall and grow quickly, and that's great. But can we uh, cut them back at certain times throughout the year to keep them shorter and still get blooms? Um, also kind of related is about deadheading. Is there any benefit to deadheading to increase blooms or extend bloom times? Any input you have on, on that management would be helpful. So some of the late blooming species, I already mentioned that on New England Aster, you can cut them down if they're, especially if it it's, tends to be like a much branch, a, a plant that tends to branch a lot anyway, like a lot of our asters or tall ironweed is another one you can cut back in early summer and have it bloom at a shorter height. Um, 
the plants that are less branchy like cone flowers that doesn't work out so well. Um, I don't recommend doing that on on those, but but species that branch prolifically are generally the ones that that thrive with the uh, an early summer cutback and will come on and and bloom. And they may bloom a little later than the than non trimmed ones, but it works pretty well. As far as deadheading, it's not normally something I recommend. Um, uh, it can help on some species that may self-sow really prolifically, say like northern sea oats that come up everywhere if you have them. So that, that would uh, help if you didn't want them to self-sow. But in general, um, I don't recommend it on native plants because the seeds are very, are, most people are growing native plants to benefit wildlife and the seeds are very important part of that, um, especially for so songbirds. Um, uh, that's what they eat over the winter. So you'll want to uh, let those seeds mature and collect them for your own use or leave them out for the songbirds. But I, like I said, I generally don't recommend deadheading and um, don't try to, and in and on many cases that doesn't, it's not very effective at extending the blooming season anyway. Okay. Um, in general, does just casting seed in January work in propagating species in fields? Let's say you're not wanting to grow them for sale or, you know, pot them up. What is the best for getting them started outside? So, yeah, if you have, um, the important thing there is to have some exposed soil. So if you have exposed soil, like it's an old soybean field or, or an old garden, um, as long as there's uh, soil exposed, yeah, broadcasting in the winter works very effectively. The freezing and thawing gets good seed to soil contact and you'll get um, pretty uh, excellent recruitment doing that. And we, we, uh, we recommend sowing uh, prairies in the, in, especially if your goal is to establish high prairies with a lot of forbs or high pollinator value is you should sow them in the, uh, during the dormant season because the, they get that really good natural moist stratification over the winter. So you end up with a really um, excellent germination on the forbs. And because a lot of the different forbs germ germinate at different uh, soil temperatures in the spring, by sowing them in the winter, you're sure that they, you haven't missed their appropriate uh, soil temperature to germinate at. So as if in, in contrast to say sowing it in May, the soil may already be too warm for some species to um, have optimal germination. And on that, a related question just came in. Um, what do you recommend as a substrate to mix into larger quantities of seeds for hand spreading or sowing them in the winter? Again, usually um, some people will recommend sand, but it's generally too heavy. You end up carrying this giant heavy bag of sand and seed. So again, it's better to use a, a soilless potting mix to mix the seed with, because that's a, a little lightweight and you can mix it easy and, and that allows you to hand broadcast. So you'll want to use about uh, two or three parts potting mix to one part seed to uh, and mix it really thoroughly and then hand broadcast that seed soil mixture. Okay. Um, someone asked about keeping native plants as indoor plants year round if they don't have a lot of outdoor accessible space. Uh, that's generally not going to work well because they have to go through a cold dormant season. Um, so if you could, you could have them indoors during the summer or, and then put them out on, on a patio during the winter, I suppose, to, to expose them to cold winter, but they, they're not like tropical plants that will grow continuously over the whole 12 months. They'll go dormant in the fall, whether they're inside or outside, and they need to, to break out of that dormancy. They need an extended period of cold time over the winter. Okay. Um, about aggressive natives, um, specifically common milkweed spreads quite aggressively. What about other types of milkweed? So yeah, common milkweed is rhizomatous, so it spreads by those underground rhizomes. Um, other milkweeds are not rhizomatous, so butterfly weed, swamp milkweed do not spread by rhizomes. Um, 
and there are some additional species that do spread by rhizomes like world milkweed, but it's a much smaller plant that grows generally in really poor dry soil. And Sullivan's milkweed is another a prairie species that does spread by rhizomes, but not as quickly as common milkweed. But yeah, yeah, common milkweed is definitely a, an aggressive spreader once established. And it seems to do best when it's mixed with grasses or other plants. Um, it's, we found uh, the common milkweed was not quite as uh, easy to establish in a monoculture as it was actually when it's growing in a meadow with other things. And do you have any recommendations for preventing overgrowth for plants that do spread aggressively, similar to false indigo? Um, proper placement, um, know the, the habit of that plant and make sure that you're planting a, a plant in a space that's appropriate given the eventual stature and spread of that species. So, um, Generally, do, do your research and make sure you're planting the right plant in the right place. That makes sense. Um, we do still have quite a few other questions, but it is one o'clock um, and a lot of the others are more broad about uh, native plants and um, which ones will work best in certain spe specific spots, um, as well as some on just converting lawn to more native habitat, which are all fantastic questions. Um, we're gonna try to follow up with you all individually and then send out some, you know, this as a resource plus more resources following. Um, I guess, Kevin, if there's anything else that you would like to cover, I apologize we couldn't get through every question, but we really thank um, everyone for being online and for the, chat uh, being so active and hopefully we can all continue to to ask questions of of everyone on this I'd, I'd just note one thing if you're establishing a uh, relatively small um, residential um, wildflower planting in a lot, former lawn area um, you'll have a, you'll be a lot happier with the uh, end product, if you do that via plugs that you can place the specific species in the specific place you want them to be rather than broadcasting a seed mix, which may end up very heavily weighted toward a particular plant or every seed mix ends up different on each site. So depending on the soils and the exposure and the moisture levels, so forth. So, so um, it's, uh, easiest to get the product you want if it's a smaller residential plant um, area. And the other, doing via plugs allows you to mulch it and treat it a little bit more like a perennial garden early on because uh, you can't really weed a seeded installation so it can look pretty rough and really bad the first couple of years, which might not be uh, uh, what you wanna see in your yard. So that's the other reason to go ahead and establish a small residential wildflower planting via plugs rather than seed. Thank you for that input and for guiding us on how to get to grow our some of our own plugs for that. Um, I think people hopefully really appreciated you being here. Um, I, I still even see more questions coming in. So I'm, I'm glad this is a hot topic for everybody. Well, th thank you um, for the opportunity to present um, today. And I guess if people have questions for you individually, well, questions for you following this, I know you provide consultancy. Um, is there a way for people to get in touch with you? What are you open to? Um, um, I would prefer them because there's so many people on this, yep. <laughs> it would be overwhelming if everyone had a question. I would prefer that they use the resources that I mentioned, such as the Prairie Moon Catalog uh, Cultural Guide or, or other web resources, just because um, now if you have a, 
individual projects that you want designed. Um, if you have a sub sub significant um, residential or landowner project that you need designed, um, then, then uh, that's something that I'd be more interested in helping people with. But, um, but as, as a consultant, we've got to have a pretty significant project and, and we have a minimum consulting fee of $500. So obviously that's not going to be one or two questions. <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Well, we will um, do our best to compile this information and send it all out to everybody. So I think that's it and uh, we'll go ahead and close out. Thank you for joining everybody.